today, unlike all the other talks, we're going to leave spirituality and religion outside the door, okay? So anything you believe about spirituality, religion, metaphysics, please leave it outside, okay? We're going to explore your brain and your body today. We're going to explore the mind. We're going to explore the potential of this human frail system we have, all right? So here's the sequence of today's activities. I'm going to show you I'm going to talk to you for another half an hour or so. Then we're going to ask Dr. Nehru to come and speak. And she's hopefully going to give us a little demonstration as well, if all goes well, and hypnotize some of us into a good trace. And, uh, and, and Dr. Prem is here as well. He's uh, uh, her partner and husband, but he's also a master Reiki and a doctor and a radiologist. And they combine medical science with neuroplasticity, neurowisdom, NLP, hypnotherapy in a very interesting way. And um, so you'll, they'll be talking about that a little later. And uh, be, back there are Kapil and Rohan. Uh, say hi, guys. Uh, they're going to be demonstrating neurofeedback technologies and, and uh, brain math. You got brain math as well? You're going to see how brain mapping works when we get to waves and patterns and things like that. So we're going to go from there and we'll then move towards higher consciousness, right, after that. And Monish and I will be dabbling into the realm of higher consciousness and what that means. Where do we act from in the world? How do we become more aware? How do we become more universal? These thinking, right, where can we go? So what I want you to end today with, and I want you to imagine this, is that by the end of the day you will realize that all religions, all spiritual practices are neuroscientific tools from our origins and history to help us become this best potential human beings we can be. Right? Everything else is a mythology or a story that somebody has made up. But the reality is that if we can understand our biochemistry, our neurology, our neuroscience, our potential, my God, you know, you can invent your own religion if you want, but you don't need it because it becomes about practice. It becomes about understanding how to tune that energy, right? Okay. The whole idea of consciousness is that it is one of the most confusing and challenging things of the 21st century, right? In fact, most people say that consciousness is what the 21st century is going to be about. That means we are actually going to see a huge shift in where human beings are heading because of our consciousness and our understanding of neuroscience. So, what I want to do is, before we start, I'm going to do a little experiment with you. And I want you to all sit straight, just sit straight, and close your eyes. And just listen carefully to every sound you can hear. Just for a minute, I won't say anything for a minute, and just listen and see how far your hearing can go. Reach outwards. Reach the sound of the ACs. Any sounds of around the room. See if you can pick up any sounds from far away. That little boost in the AC just then. Now turn your mind inwards. And see if you can hear the coffee in your stomach your heart beating. Just feel completely aware. Feel your feet touching the ground. Feel your bottom sitting on the chair. Come upwards. Feel your back, your spine your face, your neck. Feel the air gently touching your face. Lick your lips a bit. Taste the lips. Rub your fingers together. Feel the soft texture of your fingers. Become aware of every single one of your senses. 
You can hear everything. You can feel everything. Mm. Open your eyes and look around as if you're looking for the first time. Look at the colors, look at the shapes. Become aware of the other people in the room. Look at the energy around them, if you can see energy or feel their energy and their vibration. Are they alive? Can you hear their heartbeat? How aware are you right now? Right? So if you think in a typical day, how conscious we are, right? just think about how little we are in consciousness. You know, in a typical day, throughout the whole day, just try and remember, try and imagine how conscious were you this morning? You know, I have to rush here, I have to get there, I have to do this, I have to do that. It's a continuous dialogue, right? But are we really conscious? Are we really open to where this could go? What you see here is that the definition of consciousness according to the dictionary and science is that the state of being aware and responsive to one surrounding. So this is the classic scientific description of consciousness. What we did just now, how aware am I, right? And how am I interpreting that awareness in my head to a reality in my own head? That means this reality is a construct in my head alone. And everything I take in is my awareness of that and I construct it here. That perception of that thing is my consciousness. That's a scientific description. And here's a famous quote, it says that anything that we are aware of at a given moment forms part of our consciousness, making conscious experience at once the most familiar and most mysterious aspect of our lives. That means that, that even that fundamental question of who am I is an act of consciousness. Right? The mystery, you know, what am I seeing, what am I feeling? So at the core of science, at the, what they call the empiricist position, right? is that if I take my senses away, if I take everything away, I can't be conscious anymore. There's no more consciousness. So Bucky Fuller said that you take the senses away and there is no consciousness. Consciousness comes from experience. But we intuitively feel that that may not be correct. We feel that there's something more, right? So the scientific idea is that we take all our perception, our senses, awareness, information, we put it into this thing called the brain and we create a cognitive soup. We calculate things, we find patterns, we have vocabulary, we have intuition, feelings. We mix it all together and the output is consciousness. Right? So we are continuously, every second, creating this algorithm in our brains. Right? This is the scientific notion. So now I want to show you a video on what consciousness is. This image shows you that the question we have today for our dialogue, and you're going to see a lot of other people talking about this today, is that where, what is the potential of our consciousness? How far can we push this? You know, and I'm going to explore that with you today. And that's why we're calling it hacking your consciousness. That means how can I disrupt it? How can I get in there and change it? How can I alter it? This is going to be our whole exercise today and our thinking today. It is the most fundamental experience of all, defining our waking moments and giving rise to all that we think and feel. Without consciousness, we have no way of proving we or anything else exists. And yet, what it is and why we have it remain a mystery that some of the greatest minds have been unable to solve. The only way I know I exist is because I'm conscious. I wake up in the dark of a hotel room, I'm discombobulated because I'm jet lagged, I have no idea where I am, or even who I am or in what country I am, yet I know I exist because I see something. Rapid advances in our understanding of how the brain works might one day allow us to pinpoint the parts of the brain that generate consciousness. But will something as objective as science be able to explain what it feels like to be us? Consciousness, by its nature, is private. It's subjective. I know about my consciousness from the first-person point of view. Other people can only know about my consciousness very indirectly. Philosophers have been trying to answer some of these questions for millennia. 
In the past couple of centuries, scientists have joined them. Debate can be fierce. In fact, some scholars reckon the puzzle of consciousness is something the human mind is incapable of solving. I think that's not just wrong, I think it's, it's uh, culpably wrong. It isn't impossible at all, it's just that we have to buckle down and do it. One thing that both disciplines can agree on is that consciousness arises in the brain. Made up of roughly 85 billion neurons and other supporting cells about which we know little, the brain consumes almost 20% of our energy, despite comprising just 2% of our mass. Every so often I get kind of interested in astronomy and cosmology, because you look out there and you think, oh gosh, this is amazing, you know, it's almost limitless. But then I turn around and I kind of introspectively think about the brain, and it's kind of like a universe within. We're a long ways of understanding how it works, but if we could get down to figuring out how a neuron works, by God, then we could deal with it two neurons, and then four neurons, and then four million neurons, and then a hundred million. Helped by developments in imaging, partly pioneered by Dr. Reichel and his team, scientists can study in some detail the two enormous folded sheets of outer brain called the cerebral cortex. This plays a crucial role in higher brain functions like memory, perception, thought, and language. And I have two of them in my left and right. And, and it's part of this sheet that gives rise to consciousness. This sheet also gives rise to intelligence and reasoning and all the other things that we hold dear about the, about the human brain and the human mind. Christoph Koch wants to come up with a satisfactory scientific theory of consciousness before he dies. Science wants to explain everything. If, if science fails to explain the central fact of my existence, I would say then it's a, it's, it's a failure. In order to gain a better understanding of how parts of the brain work, scientists often look at bits of it that are broken. There is a little part of the brain called the cerebellum, which is at the back of my brain. Uh, if I lose it, I will be unable to, let's say, to dance or be a rock climber and I have difficulty moving. My speech becomes slurred, but uh, my consciousness will not be impaired. On the flip side, it seems that some parts of the brain may be essential for consciousness. Identifying these so-called neural correlates of consciousness would help pin down what is happening. What might the NCC, the neural correlate of consciousness, be like? Assuming that it is, that it's an emergent uh, neuroscientific process. And let me say straight away that we don't know what it's like. Before his death in 2004, Francis Crick, the co-discoverer of the structure of DNA, worked with Dr. Koch on something they termed the binding problem. Put simply, the binding problem asks how the brain integrates different bits of information it gets, both sensory and internal, into our conscious experience. In real life, the brain is terribly good and puts everything together, the movement, the shape, and, and the color. The usual way of saying the binding problem is if you have a red square and a green triangle. How is it that, that you don't have, see it as the, get the colors mixed up with the shapes? So what we talked about earlier and what we just saw was that reality is a construct of a series of activities in our brain, right? And we understand that, right? It's a construct. So the question we have for ourselves is that can we interfere with that? Can we disrupt that construct? Can we approach it and say, well, let us transform ourselves? Can we, and this is what we call hacking. Can we get in there and reprogram, rewire? And in fact, I, I want you to meet Dr. Neeru Kumar. Uh, she's going to be talking to us about that reprogramming and retelling story of your, in your brain and how to do it. And this is Manish Verma here. And he's going to be talking later about the physics and mathematics of consciousness and the universe and how we see it and where we can go to words. And we're going to talk about it. We're going to have to start with the, the human body. We call them the three F's. In fact, in medical school, they call them the four F's, I believe. The four F's, which are that we are driven at our most animal nature, right? At our core, by three main things. Fear, right? Food, and excuse the language, but F word, right? Which is the desire to procreate and copulate and continuously reproduce ourselves, right? These three are our fundamental core driving motivations of the animal instinct. 
And this is driven by something called the reptilian brain in us, which is the brain that sits along the spine and ends up at the hippocampus here down at the bottom of the brain and hits you right there where the brain meets the monkey brain, what they call the limbic region right there. Right? So that reptilian brain is a very strange brain because it has been with us since dinosaurs. It's a very ancient brain. And this brain, we have evolved still with it. It's still in us because it gives us survival mechanisms. You know, run, fear, flight. So what happens is that they've done scientific research and they've seen that the reptilian brain sends signals about a few milliseconds faster than the neocortex can handle it. So that means that it acts first in the body. So whenever anything happens to you, right? In the ancient times, it would be an animal coming to attack you or disaster, something happening. It comes on and immediately says, you are going to die, right? This very next minute, you're going to die. Do something and run. Get out of here. Fight, fear, flight, whatever you can do. Just get out. Just get out if you can, right? This is what drives the fear in us. Today, we still have that biology. And what does it come as? Stress. Tension, right? It reflects in that way to us. And you're going to talk about that, right? About stress. It's all about stress. So the stress is the leftover reptilian reaction to that. The second one is food, which is that our complete brain chemistry is dependent on what we eat and how our liver and stomach act completely. We don't realize it, but what we eat actually affects the brain. So that means everything you're thinking, how your mood, your feelings, your amount of sugar in the brain, all are driven by how your liver is working and how much insulin is in your system and what's happening to your body. So we have to learn about that too. And the third one is the F word, which is that testosterone and estrogen are the, uh, you know, in, in the, in the way, wisdom traditions, they call it yin and yang, shiva shakti, the dualities, right? What we're doing is that we are both these elements in our bodies and how much we are able to combine the two determines our wellness, our vitality, our uh, sexuality, our how much hair I have on my head. Everything is determined by these silly chemicals like testosterone and estrogen. You'll see here that the reptilian brain is all about the fear of death, stress reaction created by the adrenal gland which is above the kidneys there. You see them there, those adrenal glands. And adrenaline is the hormone that's released, right, that goes whoosh to the body and tells you, you're in trouble, run, run right now, right, you know, panic, you know, hit somebody, do something vicious, right now, right, and so we have to learn, without using medicines, how to shut that brain down for a second, right, so that when that comes at us, we have a tool that is actually able to respond, right, we don't want drugs, we want a tool. So that tool is actually controlled by the heart rate you have, right? So if you learn to meditate in the stomach area and breathe, and we're going to do that just now, and you, ca and you can monitor your heart rate, you have a heart rate monitor that you plug into your ear, right? And you have an iPad app or an Android app, and you watch your heart rate, right? And at a certain point, you lower it enough every day to a certain level, and your heart rate goes to what they call a green light, a pop, a popular curve. And that green light means that you have overcome the reptilian algorithm. So imagine that you are able to breathe and breathe until your heart rate slows down to a point where your reptilian algorithm gets override, right, ridden, click, gone. Now it can't act. Now you won't react to everything that happens. Now if you do this daily for 66 days, it becomes a practice. It becomes a neuroplasticity practice that you have in your brain, right? So you will automatically learn to deal with any stress just by simple breath and monitoring your heart rate. And people now in America, you'll see them walking around with this app, <laughs> looking at it in the, in the metro and in the, you know, and it's not expensive, but it's worth looking at, you know, and it's worth thinking about. I'll share the details with you at the end. But this is, Ways. And there are centers in Delhi where you can do this. I believe you guys do it also, heart rate monitoring, where you can go and sit and practice heart rate monitoring, right? And so heart rate monitoring is very good. Breath control is very good. 
The simplest way, and we'll practice that now, everybody just sit and sit up straight a bit and just get yourselves together, is we're going to do what the Buddhists call Hara meditation. Everybody, anybody heard of that? Hara? Hara meditation? And Hara meditation means I'm circulating air in this diaphragm area, right? Between the Ha and the Ra, between here and Ra, which is this, this point, navel and throat. The in-between area, I'm going to circulate energy there and air, right? So here's how you do it. You breathe in, but you don't breathe into your chest. You don't go, no, you breathe into your stomach. Inflate your stomach as you breathe in. Try it out. Put your hand on your stomach. Breathe in. And now breathe out. Expand your stomach. Breathe in. Don't move your shoulders, don't inflate your chest. Just breathe in with here. Now look at the area around your nose, the tip of your nose. So now you're breathing in while looking at the tip of your nose at the air going in and the air coming out. Just breathe in with your looking at that tip. See, what happens is that after a while, if you're staring at this general area here, not exactly pinpoint, cross eye your eyes and get hurt, but look around this area and you do the hara breathing, your mind actually goes to a state of almost shutdown. Right? So you want to make that happen and it automatically slows your heart rate down. Okay, so this does it right there. So if any time you... In, you're in the metro, you're driving a car, you want to hit somebody, right? You want to shout at somebody, you want to scream at somebody, you want to run away, you're feeling threatened, somebody's going to beat you or attack you or fire you. That is when you do this breath, right? It automatically shuts down the reptilian mind after a few practices. So it's literally, you're staring at this area, watching the breath go in and out, but you're expanding the stomach, the diaphragm. Literally, all right? You don't need drugs, and after a while, adrenaline, all these hormones will be under control for your fear factor. Right? The other way to control fear is, the Indians have known it for centuries, it is activating something called the muladhara, which is the anus area of your spine, right? And it's a very simple exercise. Everybody get up. Up, 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 up. <laughs> Are you okay? You can sit. Yeah. Everybody get up. Now, I'm going to teach you a breath to tighten your anus. Pull your anus up, like that. Like as if you're pulling up inside this bottom area. Right, and I'm gonna do it in a double breath, okay? You're gonna go, and suck it up, like pulling it up, 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 till it touches the roof of the mouth, all right? So here, watch. So, we're gonna do it, watch me once. You're gonna go, clasp your hands and your feet, and anus pull up and suck till it comes up and touches the tip of your tongue, touching the roof of your mouth. That area. Click your mouth. That, where that starts is where you're going to breathe into. Okay? So, ready? Double breath. Hold. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Double out. Ha! Three times. Ready? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Ha! One more time. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Ha! Relax. Sit down. Does everybody feel hotter? You feel heat? Inside heat is coming a little bit? No? Heat is also a very good way of energizing the body to prevent fear. It stops fear. Right? So if you activate your muladhara, right, that area of the anus, by the way, this is the yogic term for this is Ashwini Mudra. Okay? This is called the Ashwini Mudra. Right? The Ashwini Mudra is the best way to get your lower parts all sorted 
then you do your breathing and you are completely, nothing can mess with you. So by being this, I am no fear. I overcome fear. We were talking about that, Prem, right? The other day about fear. And muladhara, this lower area and this breath is the guaranteed way to overcome fear. Everybody got that hack? You with me? All right, I will send notes to everybody by email. Yeah. Yeah. See, fear was inbuilt in us to help us to survive. Yes. So, uh, what do these practices do to my reaction time in case of an emergency? What they do is they allow the, the neural uh, message to not hit all the hormones immediately. Mm. See, what happens is that the moment the reptilian brain kicks in, all the hormones get released. Adrenaline, you know, um, uh, uh, all the stress-related hormones, you know, your, your, your hackles go up, your, your entire... T cells start activating, thinking you're going to die. Everything goes overboard. So when you come back from stress, you're in this peak mode to survive a tiger attack, but your body, you're actually not dealing with that. You're dealing with a simple thing like fighting with your partner, right? So you have to understand that before that moment of reaction, you breathe and it, you practice that breath it stops it from sending the message to all the, the glands to hit, release the hormones. You know, this is what it does. Right? So we are not actually stopping the reptilian brain. We are bypassing it to get to informing all the body that no, don't react. Calm down. Calm down. Right? What is that famous saying? All is well. It's all we are doing. All is well. Why do you think he's hitting here? All is well. <laughs> <You know? laughs> But that's what it means, literally, right? So just remember that, okay? Did that answer your question? Yeah, but uh, after this practice, I'll still be able to react correctly and quickly when required oh, you, to safeguard you, myself. You will be a samurai. Okay. Nobody, you will be unfuckwithable. Remember that. <laughs> Nobody will be able to mess with you. You know, it's literally the case. Nobody can mess with you, right? Yeah, there will still be people who will get to you. Always. You know, some family member who knows how to get to you. Right? Everybody knows what I mean? Yeah. Right? Somebody will get you. But at least for most of the day, you, people won't be able to penetrate that barrier around you. Right? Later on, when you do some other practices with me, you'll see how you can create that environment for you to be protected. Right? Because protection is half the battle of fear. Right? So we are creating a zone around us. What they say in China, and Chinese medicine is very good at this, is that this hara, we create something called a key energy field here. Ki, right? Kung Fu comes from Ki, all those things come from Ki, right? And if you build this area here, it's like a ball of white energy that sits there and it expands to form an egg around you. So the Chinese believe that if you center here and you're doing Qigong, right? You're actually controlling that energy field around you. So nobody can mess with you, right? So then when you push out with that energy, you can actually kill or heal both. So the Reiki is a healer, but the Kung Fu guy is a killer, right? Same idea. Yes? Any other questions quickly? Yeah. I'm sure that there would be some sort of biochemistry involved or some sort of physical significance would be there with the whole practice. But, uh, uh, but mainly, are we not deviating from the like, conscious uh, perception? Of okay, the so situation? we're coming to that. We're coming yeah. to that. See, I'm starting with your base instincts first, but we're going to move higher. Okay. All right, the second one, quickly, let's move on is the FK system, which is reproductive, right? Lack of testosterone in men and in women, by the way, right? And too much estrogen in men and excess release of it in women can cause what is one of the major contributing factors towards aging, towards um, skin care, skin issues, you know, some cancers as well come out of this area, right? So testosterone maintenance is very important in the body. Right, so for most, for all of us who are not sadhus, right, releasing ejaculation or having orgasm is very important, very very important, right? And what that means is that the sadhus say no, you must turn it inwards. No, we are not sadhus; we are normal human beings, right? We need to. The actual number is one ejaculation per month prevents a lot of stress-related and testosterone-related diseases. Four a month is a good balance, right? And the rest of the time, you should learn tantric sex. 
Right? Does everybody know what I mean by that? Which means to have sexual intercourse without release of sperm. Now, if you can do that, you're a superman, and your wife will be very happy also. <laughs> so that's that for sure. <laughs> but you should learn that. You should learn those techniques, and they're breathing techniques for that. The other side is that women, in the opposite side, should have multiple orgasms in a month if they can, because it keeps the balance going. So sexuality is actually a regulator of these hormones, you know, and people underestimate it in India because we've become so programmed to think that, no, 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 you know, live like brother and sister, Satwik. No, please. <laughs> you know, it doesn't work. It doesn't work, okay? But if you are going to live like brother and sister, there are ways you can do it, right? Uh, one is meditation. There are particular meditations for the, the chakra, Swadhisthana, that you can do, sounds, feelings, all that. The other is liquid feeling, sense of liquid, any liquidy feelings help that, right? The third is testosterone supplements. So you can actually buy these little packs of testosterone and put it under your armpit, right? And that boosts your testosterone. So for men over 30, it's worth investigating testosterone supplements and testosterone replacement therapy and things like that because it actually triples your energy. You get this fantastic energy boost for weeks. And you get it, you know, your hair, might, mine not growing back, but you get your hair growing back. You know, you get, skin becomes clear. Skin becomes very clear, right? So look into these things because testosterone is a very important thing. It'll also slow down the aging process, right? One of the main reasons men age and get prostate cancer and die is because they let the testosterone and prostate diminish in function, right? And we want to boost that. And prostate is what keeps you erect, and testosterone is what keeps you virile, right? So have those in your mind. Take, take testosterone substances. The next one is food. And we, in India, we tend to don't eat for longevity or for virility. We don't eat for that. We don't. You know, we overcook our foods. We use too many um, glutens in our food. We tend to use a lot of bad fats, right? So, one of the things one has to realize is that the stomach determines two things that are very important, right? How much glucose is in the brain, right? And therefore, the brain feels alive, right? And the other is how we process happiness, serotonin, these chemicals in the stomach, acidity, that lead to happiness, right? So, if you're unhappy, the first thing you should look at is whether you're in, you've got indigestion or not. Because it could be as simple as that. To start with that simple idea, right, that I want to cleanse my stomach, right. Then what you'll find is that the yogic way or the, science, the hacking way to get the brain more active is to introduce fats into your diet, right. That means don't eat like... Uh, polyunsaturated fats, use ghee, real ghee, right? Real foods like that, you know, real butter, you know. You know, they, in, in the West they call it grass-fed butter. Well, here we have garbage-fed butter, but it's okay. You know, we, we still get butter, you know. <laughs> but butter, you know, um, don't think that by using, you know, hard gold oil will get better. It's not going to get better. It's, not, it's better with butter, honestly. It is really better with butter. And less dairy, you know, m less, less starch. These things actually increase longevity, increase vitality, and they clear the brain. Now, what they found is that why do yogis have clear brains, right? This is the big question, right? How do you clear the brain with food? Is that they actually do fasting, right? So in Tibetan all, some of these monks, what they do is they'll drink a tea, or you can do it with coffee, and they add ghee to it. Right? And they also add something called, which is a combine of coconut oil right, to it. And the reason they do that is that coconut oil is a, is a ketonic catalyst. It creates a thing in your brain right, that says that, oh my God, I need sugar. Right? I'm desperate for sugar. But if you take the coconut oil, it feeds the brain ketones, which is an alternative to sugar in the brain, right? And at first, the brain thinks it's dying, but then it 
click, kicks in and all the neurons start firing at full capacity. So that kind of diet where you actually ingest fat convinces the brain that, wait, you're not dying, you're actually clearer. Neurons start firing better. Neurons start getting better. So learning about diet is very good. And another thing I would add is that fasting is very good, right? That means drink the, that ghee in the morning and then don't eat for four or five hours, you know. Try one day, see. There's a combination drink you can make with coffee, ghee, and coconut oil. That's, uh, in America, it's called the bulletproof system. But it actually, we've been doing it in India for a long time, in South and in Himalayas, where you combine these three and you drink it. Right? And you will get six, seven hours of pure energy and clarity. Right? It's fantastic. I do it every morning. You know? And the other thing I would do is what they call superfoods. Everybody know about superfoods? Right? But uh, unusually, the most excellent superfood for meditation and for hacking is Moringa. We were talking about it the other day, right? Um, which, and gooseberries, amla, these things, right? These are very good superfoods, right? Um, kale, wheatgrass, but, but the best is moringa. Moringa and spirulina. They are, like, you can buy them in capsules in any drugstore or, or in powder, and you make a shake or a drink, and you just drink one glass, and it gives you all day, and it, you don't need diabetic medicine, you don't need all that stuff. You should try it. <laughs> and superfoods are very cool. Um, the other side is that, you know, I, I'm not big on avoiding things, right? But here's a clever way to hack your biology on food, okay? Go back to basic eating for a few days, like a week, let's say. Ek hafte, no atta, no maida, no rice, no potato, no sugar, no milk, no butter, nothing. Like, just eat vegetables, salad, fruit, and... If you eat meat, eat some meat, like light cook, not in oil too much, right? Uh, no chapatis, no nothing, right? First three days, start with that, right? In the morning, drink a juice or a, that coffee drink I talked about. Then after a week, start introducing things that you were using before, right? So you will find some will give you congestion. Some will give you stomachache and gas. Some will give you um, inflammation and swelling. Right? By doing that, in fact, there's a doctor you were talking about, what's her name? Minu Nageshwaram, if you want to write it down, who does these health-based detox, vegan detoxes and things like that, that's worth looking into. Padma Center. Padma Center in Hoskas, that does it. So you have been access in Delhi to some very new thinking in food, right? And I really suggest that hacking food is a very important part of biology so can I, can the, I if, if anybody wants to know uh, it is yeah. with a cup of coffee you can don't add dude if you can don't add milk but you put a little milk if you want and instead of sugar use um, stevia use stevia 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 is very good for cleansing stevia right Shuk, sweetener so you can get stevia at any shop stevia sweetener right use stevia and then one tablespoon of ghee one tablespoon of purified coconut oil, not the balwala, not the hair one, the drinking, eating one, right? They're available. In your coffee, right? You know, mix it up and drink it. At first, you will want to vomit, but it's okay. No, you won't want to vomit. Put, uh, <laughs> put the uh, stevia. And then, after a few days, you'll love it. You'll think, wow, you know, because the energy boost from that alone, right, will be fantastic. The energy boost from that. And then take two capsules of Moringa, because I do that, and I don't eat again till about 11. Right? And, and normally I meditate from 6, and I'm up doing Qigong and martial arts and all that stuff. I do that. So I'm, I'm going all day. Right? And then about 11, I eat fruit, and then I eat some more. And then now I've been testing what foods to introduce. So if I eat particular types of bread, I immediately get headaches. Right? I can't eat them. If I eat cheese, I get stomachache. I get gas. Right? If I drink Coca-Cola, I get sick, you know. So it's telling me, your body tells you what to do, right? But you've got to hack yourself by listening to your body, you know. Remember how we were aware earlier and we were listening? Same thing, why can't we listen to our body when it's talking to us, you know. By the way, just doing this technique, I've been hacking for about a month or two. I've lost about six, seven kg already, you know. I'm feeling great, you know. Mornings are no more a pain. I get up and I'm up. In fact, I'm very painful to my wife right now. <laughs> she says, go back to being low energy. <laughs> All right. Okay, watch this video. 
whenever you go to a spiritual teaching or a practice, we always hear the word higher consciousness, right? Higher self. So, in a purely logical reference, this means that are we bypassing the reptilian to create a new reality from our other mind, this fantastic copri we have here, this neocortex, right? Are we able to create a new reality? Are we able to see the world differently? Can we be better, kinder, nicer? That's what they're saying, right? Everybody follow that? Yeah. Yes? So, we don't need religion or spirituality to answer that question. The answer is obviously yes. We want to be better. We want to be kinder, nicer to people, right? In fact, every time we're nicer to somebody, the world gets better, right? We feel better. We get better back. We get feedback. We are feedback animals. We need feedback all the time. You know, I love you. You don't love me? Oh my God, my life's over, right? Now, those are the lower heart side working. But what if we could expand that? So we're looking at this idea of happiness. So let's start with the fundamental one, which is happiness, right? And, and with happiness, we're dealing with four primary chemicals, okay? So you want to hack yourself for happiness and avoid depression, you've got to work with these four chemicals, all right? That means you don't need medicine, but you need actual understanding of how they work in your body, right? And the first one is serotonin. So, and serotonin is actually the most important one, and we'll come to that later. Why? Serotonin is produced mostly in the stomach, but also produced by the pineal gland in the brain, right? And serotonin is the feel-good, holistic feeling of good. The world, I'm meaningful life. My life has meaning. My life has something, a goal, a destination, a value, you know, serotonin. And serotonin is actually, this is what the Buddhist monks teach. This is what all Dalai Lama and all talk about, right? Which is that, can I work from the heart, right? With, they say the heart. It's because the heart determines the timers and it's all here. And these hormones that are released here are very in tune with well-being and T-cells and things like that that come up there, very in tune. It's like liquid secretions go on. And one of those that are incurred is the, it pulls up serotonin from the stomach and gives it to the brain. Whoosh. And that means that you feel that you've done something good. You feel you've done something worthwhile, right? Meaningful, right? So serotonin can be introduced by a simple practice that the Buddhists use and many other practices use called gratitude, right? Reiki, everybody, who has done Reiki here? Who has done Reiki? Everybody has done a little bit of Reiki? You understand that one of the first principles of Reiki is gratitude, right? I have to give thanks to somebody or something for what I have done, right? So if I vibrate in gratitude, so every day in the morning, when you get up, right, do a simple act of gratitude. That means I am grateful. I am just happy that I'm alive. I'm grateful. I'm right here. Now you can take that further. If you do good for other people, if you do seva, if you do other things, gratitude actually, serotonin keeps getting produced. So those people who do langars and service all the time, the reason they look so happy and blessed is because serotonin is continuously being released for them. Right? So you want to find a way for a meaningful life to release serotonin. Right? And the best one is gratitude. Right? And practice gratitude if you can. Right? There are other ways which we'll come to later in meditation techniques we can do. The second one is oxytocin, which is the love, the love chemical, which is basically uh, orgasm, when I have orgasm and mental feeling, when I have a baby in my hand or a baby comes out of a mother, that feeling of love, unconditional love, you know, that when you hug everybody. So I, I know you're all strangers here, but I would say get up and hug each other. Then you release oxytocin, right? It is very true. You know, and if you hug people, if you hold people, you know, you hold their hands, chemical reaction occurs, right? Oxytocin is that chemical that makes you feel wonderful. It's like a wonderful chemical. So if you're able to release that, you will not be able to be angry. You'll not be able to, you know, uh, hate somebody too much. That's why if you, somebody's feeling down or angry, you hold them. 
it helps. It brings them down, right? It comes down. Oxytocin, okay? The third one is dopamine. Dopamine is what it's one of the neural triggers it, it, that transmitters. In, in fact, people with Parkinson's have very low dopamine production, right? They're, they're, it's a terrible thing. You know, you get that no firing in the brain. Dopamine is the brain's reward system. That means that I did a project and something good happened. I celebrate dopamine. All good, right? So instead of thinking of big projects in life, dopamine, best way to release dopamine is to set up little celebrations for every little thing you do. You know, today I did 50 push-ups. Let's do it. 20 push-ups. Let's go, right? Today I did half an hour meditation. Celebrate, you know? These little celebrations release dopamine. So that's why in companies and organizations, we encourage you to do rewards, retreats, pull up things together. So people release more dopamine in the group, right? And dopamine in a group creates group collective. Yes, we can do it. You know, the negative side is that armies go and fight wars, but we don't want that. We want everybody to feel good. Dopamine, right? And the last one is endorphins. The moment you're in pain or stress or fear, the body releases endorphins, right? And endorphins are the, like morphine, they're a painkiller. They stop you from feeling bad. You know, it's a thing. And the, what endorphins do is that they let you re-come back to non-negativity. You know, that this pain is nothing. This pain is not suffering. I'm not really suffering, right? And endorphins, um, if you ever wondered why you should join a laughing club, endorphins. Okay? You go to the park in the morning and you laugh. Right? That's great. Lot, lots of comedies, endorphins will be released, right? Sports. Who, everybody loves some, some, I know you love sports. People love sports. Any form of sports, right, will release endorphins, right? That's why you will find very few sports people are depressed. You know, very unlikely, you know. So, any of these four will cure depression <laughs> in you, but you have to learn to hack them, okay? Any, any questions on that? I'll just keep going. It's the little hacks I'm giving you. Okay, so the last part is now hacking the brain. Let's go to that. So, this picture is interesting because we all know that everything is about the brain, right? We're okay with that? So, how do I get full activation of this brain, you know? How can I activate this full brain, right? So we're going to talk about the brain from first thing starting from that, right? Which is Limitless is a very interesting film, and so was Lucy, recent film, and of course Matrix, which says that there was this pill that they took, right? And this pill triggered full brain activation, right? And when they had full brain activation, suddenly this man who was like a loser, useless fellow, suddenly becomes a super conscious being who remembers everything, knows every book he's ever read, gets everything. This is the moment where he takes the pill, all right? This is a short clip, four minutes only, where he takes the pill and he's about to suddenly realize that he knows everything. So, the big argument today is, should we take drugs and pharmaceuticals to expand our consciousness or should we rely on the good old spiritual methodologies and practices of the gurus and the, and the Vedas and all that stuff, right? That's the big question right now. And all the movies nowadays, and especially a lot of young people, I'm sure all of you here, have either thought about it or want to experiment with it, have thought about what to do with it. And it's, this whole new area is called nootropics, right? Nootropics, right? At the extreme end, and you'll see it's LSD and, and DMT and things like that, but at its core, in available pharmaceuticals, right, there are actually now smart drugs, you know, and that are known to PhD students and all over the world, and authors use them, and professors use them, and, and the nootropic industry has gone through a lot of bad drugs and good drugs, and now one or two have emerged that are the new NZT that we saw. That film, the drug is called NZT in the film. And the drug that is now the drug considered, and I'm not saying use it, but I have used it, and it's, it's a pharmaceutical, you can buy it, the doctor can prescribe it. It's a narcolepsy medicine used in narcolepsy for sleep apnea and sleep disorder called modafinil. Uh, in India, it's called Modalert, right? And I know everybody's going to go out and buy it now. <laughs> 
<laughs> but what it does is you take 100 milligrams in the morning, right? And you get a full day of clarity like only certain types of meditation can give you, you know, complete clarity. You know, you, you will write more, do more, produce more, exercise more. So if anybody wants to try it, it's non-addictive, right? Uh, your chemist will give it to you. But if you take 200 grams, right, you go into overdrive, right? So if you, so if you ever want to write a novel and you think, I don't have the energy or the inspiration to write this novel, 200 milligrams of modafinil in the morning on the day you're going to write, and by evening at 3 o'clock in the morning, you'll have a full, full book written, you know, <laughs> and it works, all right? So I'm not encouraging it, but I'm saying that this is a reality, that nootropic performance mind drugs are the next wave of what's coming, you know, the better you, right, you know? In NZT, in the new Limitless TV series, he holds the pill up and says, NZT, you know, <laughs> change your mind, you know. So it's not, it's there. So let's just keep going. And so there are others which are more commonly available, but they have nothing on modafinil. Amphetamines, amphetamines is the drug of choice of crackheads and things like that, right? It's the, it's the you know, methamphetamines. <laughs> you get instant blast of reality, right? But then you come down. With modafinil, you don't come down. Right. Um, now, obviously, I don't use it anymore because I use meditation, but it's a very good way to get back in sync, you know, without addiction. Caffeine, these are all, you know, nicotine, these are all smart drugs, right? These are all super smart drugs. They're smart drugs. I'm going to talk a little bit about LSD. LSD is the most powerful man-made substance available today. It's illegal. But I'm going to talk to you because Imperial College has just released a bunch of research now on what happens to the brain when you take LSD. I'm going to show you a short film so you can see what that is, okay? On, from Imperial College. Go ahead. So the direction science is taking now with all these things is very interesting because they're now showing that the extracts from psilocybin mushroom, for example. Mushroom, you heard of some mushrooms, psilocybin? Is, can be used for as an antidepressant now. So medical companies are working on that. LSD is seen to do de-addiction and things like that very strongly, right? So we are seeing a new surge after the illegalization for 30, 40 years of it into new research into three areas, uh, psilocybin, LSD, and something called DMT, right? And DMT is the God particle. We'll talk about that at the end to talk about how to release it in you without drugs. So, the, the concept in physics, and you're going to talk about this, right? I'll just quickly touch upon it, is that the universe at its core of creation, at its core of vibration, right, is silence, right? There's a silence to that initial from which all quantum emanations occur. You know, now we don't say Big Bang, we say quantum fluctuation. It occurred, something occurred, and the universe came into being, right? And everything that acquires that from dark matter upwards to bubbling to planets to us to whatever is a vibrationary particle that comes at some level upwards. Everybody okay with that? Got that? So let's go to the next slide. And if we take that concept, the science of beta waves is that there are four states that science looks at right now to determine the mental state of a person at any level. In India, we have a very similar model for in yoga and in Vedanta, the idea of Turiya and awaking consciousness and those areas. will do. Now, beta is your normal waking self, right? So we want to, in meditation and that breathing we did, go towards lower uh, alpha and theta. We want to go to alpha and theta. Alpha is a meditative state which means I am breathing, I am aware, I am, like you were this morning when we did that consciousness thing, that's alpha, right? You want to get to alpha. And then we go to theta, which is deep, deep meditation is theta level, right? And, and then delta, which is complete uh, non-REM sleep, right? And the yogis who are at that samadhi, nirvakalpa state are also in that fully awake, in that deep sleep state, right? So, again, last year they found a new on-off switch in the brain. The claustrum now they discovered, they've just done it on one patient, now they're doing it with multiple patients to see what happens, 
is that if they sent electrode um, stimulation to that area in that this part of the brain called the claustrum, two parts, right? The person became a zombie. That means they were fully functioning, heart was working, body working, but no cognition, just zombie, like this. And then they put it like on, off, and the person woke up and didn't even know that they had gone out. So it was literally like a robot turning on and off, like that. This is what you want, right? <laughs> and what we find is that in meditation techniques, we will look at that. And why don't we practice one right now? There's mindfulness, there's blurring of reality, binaural sounds and vibrations, and light and darkness and neurofeedback. So we're going to look at these, that how we can get closer and closer to shutting our brains down, right? Without completely going off, otherwise who will put it back on? <laughs> This is why they say you need a guru, so that they can come and turn it back on for you. <laughs> no, it's not true. All right. Um, so, very quickly, um, if you just stare at this candle for a second and listen to these sounds. Stare at the candle like a gaze, as if you're blurring it out in your eyes. So you're not fully focusing in detail, but you're letting it come to your eyes. And listen to the sound with both sides of your, your brain. So the the even if for one millisecond, right, you were looking at that candle, there must have been one millisecond when your brain stopped thinking. Did anybody experience that? That there was no thought, you were just there. You were just staring at this blurring candle, right? You were just staring, right? This, we call this, in the yogic tradition is called Turiya, right? Which is that state of nothingness. Right? That is the beginning of that turning off of the brain, what you were asking about. Right? So just by simply sit in the park and gaze at something like a leaf until it blurs, right? your brain will automatically shut down, even for a few seconds. Now that's the state you want. Okay? You experience a little bit of it. Imagine if you meditated with me for half an hour on that. We'd be on a different state. And that's why I want to take you, but this is where the beginning is. The beginning is to hack that. So I'm riding on the metro. I'm sitting in my car in traffic. I just gaze off into the distance. Right? I do it all the time. And people think I'm completely weird. Because <laughs> I just, uh, this, this guy, Ashutosh thinks I'm not talking to him anymore. I'll be sitting there and looking that way over there somewhere. Right? I'm just drifted. What I do is I'm picking a spot and I'm just blurring. Right? And I'm listening. But ears and blurring go hand in hand, as do closing eyes and covering. Right? So the next step is to cover the eyes. You know, and then it goes inside. Right? And it blurs inside. So we can turn it on and off ourselves. Okay? And I'm just going to, I've shown you a little touch of it, a little bit. <laughs> Teaser. Okay, let's go. Next one. Sorry. Um, sir, I have a question. Yeah. At, uh, while we are um, you know, on that state, uh, eyes do get heavy and you know, uh, one does tend to close them automatically and perhaps it uh, translates into something we call a sleep. So, you know, where is that thin uh, line that separates? So, the it's, sleep? it's all about timing. So, if you stay in that Turiya state for about 30 seconds, right, and then you close your eyes and you visualize it inside your head. And you keep doing that on and off, 30 seconds on, 30 seconds off, 30 seconds on, 30 seconds off. Your brain won't get tired. And then after a while, you'll be able to stare at it and blur completely. Or you turn it inward to the tip of the nose we did earlier, or the, the third eye here, right? Any one of those. And it keeps you internally seeing things. So it's, a, it's actually a tuning mechanism and a focusing mechanism. So we need to toggle, that's what you're saying? You right? need to toggle, but eventually that won't be a question anymore for you. Okay. It'll go away. Right. All right? Well, thank you. <laughs> because, you know, if you do it right, you can do this for hours. You know, 
Um, the reason we use mantra, right, in the yogic tradition is that mantra takes us to that alpha state very quickly also, right? If I just Om Namah Shivaya, Om Namah Shivaya, Om Namah Shivaya, Om, but in that way, Om Namah Shivaya, 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 after a while you will also go into Om Namah Shivaya, Om Namah Shivaya, and we start doing into a rhythm, right? And if, if I can rhythm, get that rhythm going, right? After a while, thought will go. So the TM people drew this map. This is transcendental meditation of mantra chanting. So if your eyes are closed without mantra, the brain, they measured it, has sporadic activities in different parts, right, going on all the time. So you're thinking, did I have coffee this morning? Should I do that? What about Sri M's video? What about this? What about that? You're doing all this stuff in your brain, right? But he said that, but that guru said this, you know, thinking all these things, right? But if you're doing meditative tantric uh, chanting, transcendent, the whole brain starts getting activated. So what we learned now on the biology side, remember we've talked about the three fears and, and the sex drive and the, and, the, and the food need. We talked about heart and compassion and, and serotonin. We talked about how it feeds the brain, you know. But if you, when you look at it very carefully, there's something in the brain that seems to be a gateway, right? And we call it the third eye, we call it different things, right? And we've been doing a lot of research into this. It's the pineal gland, right? So this area of the brain where the lizard brain meets the monkey brain, right? Meets the human brain or the dolphin brain, you want to call it. That junction is a very critical junction for consciousness, right? It is where the pituitary, the pineal, and the, th the, the th thalamus are there, the hypothalamus and all are there. This space, right, is what governs consciousness and governs your body, your sleep, your happiness. Everything happens in this one little junction. And the key to it all is this little bean inside your head called the pineal gland, right? This has been known since ancient Egyptian times, but we are now exploring the science of it. You know, what does it mean? Can you go to the next slide? So, where does this come from? The pineal gland is a remnant of our lizard brain. Right? It has been there in lizards and snakes for dinosaur times. And birds also have it. It's a little lobe, eye, that at the top of the head that points upwards in lizards and is open for the first few days of most lizards' life and then it closes. Because it allows them to find their mother once they come out of the egg. It's a device of connecting to source, food, food, you know, like food source. So at its very core, it's there, and you see it in most lizards and reptiles, you'll see it there. And it's also built into our spine. So we actually have a serpent going up our spine and ending at the, the, where the hippocampus, where it meets that junction. Uh, in fact, one of the yogi, yogic nadis is to touch the hippocampus called Kechori Mudra. You push the tongue back and you push it in and you touch it and you create a circuit and boom, Amrit comes, right? And if you look at the pineal gland, it's got cones and rods just like an eye inside it, which are useless. Nobody uses them, right? We don't use them in day-to-day -day life. They, they found that it only comes into activation in the 49th day of childhood, of gestation in the womb where consciousness becomes apparent, gender becomes clear, the pineal gland and the testes come at the same time, or the ovaries come at the same time. Right? They also find that it is something that seems to release a chemical at death and during consciousness birth, which is related to metatonin, which is what it produces normally, called dimethotreptamines. Right? Everybody heard of dimethotreptamines? Anybody? DMT. Yeah. Who's heard of DMT? Good. So I'm not talking to a blind, fully audience, right? DMT is called the God particle, and we'll come to that in a second, right? These receptors in the brain, right? They, all those things we talked about earlier, serotonin, psilocybin, the magic mushroom, DMT, and LSD, are all very similar molecular structures, right? So if you look at them, the brain's receptors, where your neurons meet your transmitters, where they actually attach, are actually interfaces of activity and require molecules to talk to each other. Right? They require certain chemicals to talk to each other. 
Normally, we talk with serotonin and metatonin in the brain or other chemicals like oxytocin and things like that. Sometimes, under certain circumstances, other ones are released, right? And this is what creates fantastic hallucinatory experiences. This is what creates the vision of God, the vision of light. These things happen with that. So, DMT is now considered to be the closest we have come to the molecule created by men in, and women in deep states of meditation when they see illumination, when they see light. Because a, a scientist called Rick Strassman did a series of experiments where he injected people with DMT in laboratory circumstances and they, they tracked what they saw and it was identical to yogic experiences, to shamanic experiences, to cave paintings, you know, and things like that. And they found that huge illumination, intelligent beings coming to people, um, transcendental states of awareness or going towards light, you know, things like that, right? So what they felt was that the, the scientific argument is that this is a great argument by science and we have to acknowledge its possibility that when the body is about to die, right, in order to make death less painful, the pineal gland releases DMT and floods your brain with DMT. And they've seen the traces of DMT in the mind. And what happens is that the last movie you see before you die is fantastic. It is just mind-blowing. Light, angels, beings, God, everything happening wonderfully for you. Ancestors, family members, sorry. Sorry for interrupting. Uh, no matter what way you die? No, they're saying that if you die tragically or accidentally, the chance of DMT coming is low. But if the body feels it's going to die, it kicks in, right? And yeah, I think that if suddenly an axe came and just chopped off my head right now, I have no DMT. <laughs> I'll be stuck in this mortal coil <laughs> without any good movie to watch. But most people who have end of life death experiences, like you know, near death experiences, have come back with this story of light, of illumination, and the same thing with DMT. And uh, so this is a typical vision of a near death experience, right? A tunnel of light, angels around you. I've shown it in my other talks as well. Those who have been to my other talks, right? So, what do we get from all this? So, one argument is that it is the brain's final coping mechanism to do with death and our ancient rishis and mystics and drug-taking shamans discovered it, right? And they thought, wow, we can have it while we are still alive. We can see that light. We can meet those angel beings, right? And if you look at most spiritual traditions, they'll say that in order to experience that, you have to die in this life. So it's almost like they go to death, you know, most of the rishis and all. They'll fast, they'll do penance, they'll sit in caves, they won't eat. They'll go into death mode. And then the body releases these chemicals and, ah, you have seen the God, <laughs> you know. So at the one side is this argument that it is a chemically induced state. Right? Good scientific explanation. But the other side is that there seems to be something more behind that veil. Everybody follow me? Something kuch hai pe. Some intelligence, some connection, something is there, you know. And this is what we're discovering more. All this stuff we're doing, and going back to wisdom now, is that if I removed all the language of religion and spirituality, I can argue that you have a spinal system that can be awakened a beam of light, light going through you, connecting you from earth to cosmos, nature, however you want to see it. And if your mind opens and your full brain activation occurs, another dimension of reality is open to you. Right? I can say that without once referring to Vedanta or Upanishads or anything. Right? I can say that. Right? I don't even have to talk about which god. I don't have to give a name to the god even. Right? Actually, the god is you. Just you. There is no other God. right? So, if I said that to you, would that be a good definition of superconsciousness? What do you think? Somebody talk to me about this. What do you think? Tell me something about your feeling of superconsciousness. What do you think it is? Any, any ideas? Any suggestions beyond that one? 
one possibility would be like it's another it's kind of dimension per se that yes is, you're accessing that another dimension right that we're not able to see yeah continually. or what if we could also argue that our limited senses only see so much and there's so much more to the universe there at different levels of frequencies that we can't even begin to see yes. correct would you agree that yes. we can only see about 40 uh, hertz we can uh, we can only go up to about 600 megahertz 600 or so what if we can beyond that if you could suddenly see what would you see would there be beings i don't know i have no idea right no idea frequency goes higher and higher or lower and lower what do you see you know that's a good argument right so basically i am a limited technology engine right you agree so what we said earlier what, we are we are limited uh, uh, limited in, uh, we are having a limited engine we are using a limited engine yes we, we don't we have, know we have got a fantastic engine but we don't know how to use it huh. <laughs> so all this dialogue is to say that how do you explore that potential right and the only way to do it is to move towards super conscious mind so i have to hack your consciousness to get you towards moving towards a super conscious state see most people in life would be happy where you were just now when you smiled and giggled and laughed and enjoyed the moment right that's enough for most people but i don't think all of you are here because that's enough would you agree not enough no little bit more little bit more information little bit more. much 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 more right this is very interesting i have i'm a student across mystical mystical cultures i study east and west i'm i'm a practitioner i practice kundalini kriya i practice shri vidya i practice a lot right and i'm also a scientific mind and explorer so for me this is when i was younger i studied all of them and i saw these common traits which were there for whether you took soma in india or you practiced yoga or you did mer kaba in egypt and jewish kabala or whether you did it across the world every culture had the same certain types of outcome of super conscious states right one immense light a thousand suns will explode in your head it seeing para brahman is like seeing a thousand suns krishna says to arjuna right the 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 sahasrara is a thousand let petal lotus right that means a thousand suns explode in your head light like you've never imagined right number one promise so that's a good super conscious state to have while you're alive right number two is immense energy and power So I've been doing qigong now for a year or two. I did yoga before I did martial arts. This qigong, this ki energy, this super energy I have that comes from food that comes converting that energy into super states of consciousness and then as you elevate your consciousness, that energy goes up also, right? Dramatically. So you're able to sustain yourself for days with minimal food and power and sh- you know, shakti what we call, right? This is it, you know. The third one is huge creativity and beauty and compassion in the world you know you feel like you're just wonderful feeling number 4 is that and this is the part where we we were to, you, what you were saying is that we seem to meet other intelligent beings you know this is very fascinating no because we're dealing with what are we dealing with here right the shaman say they take the ayahuasca they go into the plant and the plant tells them what to do right gives them information the yog the 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 bhakti yogis will say that i prayed on krishna and krishna came to me i i meditated on shiva he came to me i worship devi she came to me right somehow this apparition comes somewhere right in your mind in your vocabulary and angels demons all these are there right what are these so one argument is that these are biological intelligence in our dna in our body that we are perceiving when we go into those trance states like so the in the shri vidya which is the devi worship school they say goddess is not outside goddess is nadis in your body that you have to travel to 
and go and feel them and see them. Then you worship them. You open the key and you open, right? So these are fantastic ideas, right? There's this huge intelligence going on. Then the last one, the last two, is bliss, ananda, which is the guarantee of all these practices. Sat, chit, ananda. Bliss, bliss, bliss. Right? Ultimate bliss. That means you happiness like you've never had. You know, unbelievable happiness. Right? And the last one is immortality. Tell me what you think immortality means. What do you think immortality means? What's your idea of immortality? Something which we, we transcend our, our, our uh, uh, chemical and bio, uh, biological bodies and pervade freely. So that's, that's for me is immortality. So it's like uh, Carl Sagan would say, you're like stardust. You, be, you become conscious right. of everything. Right, right. That's nice. Anybody else have an idea of immortality? Yeah, go ahead. For me, immortality means that we are something beyond the body. This body is perishable, but we continue um, beyond it also and but, take on but, different bodies. But let's explore that. What is it that continues beyond the body in your mind? Let's talk about that. The soul. But what is a soul? Uh, that is a very tough one to answer because we okay. are all uh, moving towards that. Science will argue there is no soul, right? Buddhism will argue there is no soul. And that's a religion, major religion that we all like and admire. They argue, ana atma, no need for a soul, right? That means no paramatma even, right? In Buddhism, there is no paramatma or anatma, right? There is only you. Only you and your mind, right? So, see, there is something which remains with us throughout our lives. Like, even as a child, there was something inside me which was going through all the experiences, observing, learning. That same component is with me today as an adult and will remain with me um, when I uh, become old. So, even though like the material body is constantly transforming, there is something which is static and which is uh, always present. And that is... Uh, the closest uh, that I can come so, to defining so you, soul. So what you're saying is that that part of me yeah. which does not perish after my body goes. Yeah, and which, which, uh, and, uh, which always remains with me even though the body is constantly changing. But that one constant thing which remains with me always. So, so, so it's a human desire to find one unchanging element in themselves. Right. It is a Mortal. desire. It is no, a no, desire. Not, no? not a desire, it actually exists. No, but that's your belief. Yeah, but we can feel it like... Ah, it is there's no feeling. No, no. It's your belief. You believe that this part of you exists that does not yes, change. Believe. It's a belief. Because, Just it, believe. because in deep sleep, that, that I-ness goes away. Goes but that's away. also... A, even conscious of your being there. But we haven't explored scientifically sleep enough to describe that. But I agree with what you're saying. But, okay, so I, if I sat here with you, we could argue the soul till tomorrow. <laughs> right? So, in our dialogue, do we need the soul? Let's first deal with that, right? And I think that, that, that what I like about the idea of super consciousness, what you were saying, was that, first of all, can I even imagine it? Right? Can I imagine myself like Buddha nature? Everywhere, immediately, instantly, in every being, in you, in me, right now, this moment, this instant. Can I imagine it? If I can imagine it, then belief structures can come, right? I can say it's a soul, I can say it's uh, immortal mind, I can say super mind. I can s there are some arguments that the universe is one big mind and we are just little particles of that mind returning to that big mind, right? There are arguments for that. There's arguments for an Akashic record, a record where all collective consciousness of mankind goes, right? And from which we download into new bodies, right? So, yeah. I, I have a comment. Yeah. Who's talking? Here. Oh. <laughs> I, have, I have a comment to make in this. So, if we look at the progression, uh, specifically if we look at the progression over the last hundred years, yeah. the ability to, to, to travel at a certain rate and pace, the ability to communicate without physically being there, the ability to be able to do video conferencing, the ability to be able to do holographic uh, you know, uh, conferencing and other things, isn't this that at some level we are without even getting into the spiritual consciousness and everything purely as a technology isn't it that we are getting a little bit beyond the space-time continuum or the, the limitations what space-time provides us there's a very nice argument to say that 
our technology is a reflection of our greatest aspiration. Would you agree? Yeah. Right? If our aspiration is conquest, we'll make the greatest army technology possible. Right? The best bombs, the best whatever. If our, if our aspiration is evolutionary of consciousness, evolution of consciousness, we will create internets. We will create new ways of working. We will create new ways of communicating. We will create new ideas. You agree? Would you agree? So if we agree that, then no matter what the language is, soul, mind, whatever you want to call it, these are just metaphors for those principles we are looking for, right? Perennial philosophy, uh, what goes on after death, right? You see, for most people, it is very depressing to think that after I die, I may not exist anymore, you know? That's why we invent things like, I'm sorry, invent the soul and invent God <laughs> and heaven and lokas. We do that because it helps us cope with death. The reality is that there are airport lounges to go to, but they may not be what you think. I don't think they are lokas. I don't think they are heavens you go to after you die. I think they are in your head and you can connect to them, right? And when you die, you go to a particular energy or vibration that takes you there, right? Now, quantum consciousness is saying that Penrose and Stuart Hammerhoff science are saying that there's something called the microtubules in the brain, right? And they think that a certain amount of photons leave the brain and go through them into another state of collective consciousness, into a photonic soup, right, of some kind, the biosphere. Yeah, when you die. Now, so there's a whole new theory coming. So I could find a new theory that explains soul as photons, Leaving the body, right? We could do that. So, okay, here's what I'm saying. Is that super consciousness for me means that physically, the, where can I take this body? Mentally, where can I take this brain? Human potential. And then, is there exploration beyond that? And am I fearless enough to try and do it? Right? There was a wonderful saying that Joseph Campbell said. He said that, Given the choice between experiencing God or going to a lecture about experiencing God, most Americans would go to the lecture. Because we, are, we don't know what's that unknown, right? I mean, how many people outside this room are willing to try and discover God or discover this soul or discover... Most like to hear about it and do... Time has been passed, but nobody has <laughs> <laughs> but what? But the human mind is fantastic. We invent bhajans and kirtans to help us all good. That's also vibrating. We, it raises our vibration. We invent pujas and mantras. We have 108 goddesses in the body that you can pray to. We have shivas. We have this. We have that. We keep coming up with wonderful metaphors and ways of tuning that. But the purest form, sorry, just one second. The purest form in India we have, if you want to study the philosophy of India, you must study the Upanishads. Because that is the purest and the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali. If you just do those two things, right, you have solved most of these questions and dilemmas and problems, right, on the philosophical side. Then you go and look at science and enjoy it, you know, and things like that. Everything else is just a good pastime while you travel. <laughs> ye karo, wo karo, ye karo, wo karo. You know, sorry, who is saying? Uh, what do you mean by immortality? <sighs> if a part of me imagines that I was there at that moment of the quantum fluctuation, some part of me was there, right? That means I've been here since then, right? Some part of me in my molecules, in my DNA has memory of that moment, somewhere. Would you agree? Yeah. Would you agree? Yeah. There's a collective memory we have of the beginning of the universe. We don't know how to tap into it. We don't know how to pull it up and look at it on a screen. We don't know how to do it yet, but maybe we do, right? So, my definition of immortality is the moment I can imagine beyond space and time, I am immortal. So it means that there is no space, no time, no limitation to my consciousness right now, right here. 
this very moment, if I sat here with you and showed you the galaxy, right, you would be immortal just for a second. You would know what it meant. Right? The physical body will die. Your consciousness will dissolve. Right? It'll inevitable. <coughs> Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah, but isn't that kind of given? I mean, if you yes. Yes. So, uh, and most people die yeah. hoping beyond hopes. Yeah, but so by that definition, everybody is anyways immortal. So, we don't, why do the we waking up call, the wake up call is to wake up and be ready to die this instant and therefore experience that total bliss. Are you ready? If not, enjoy the bhakti. <laughs> But let's wind up here. Any last questions? Is that okay? Yeah. Because everything else is good pastime. Like watching a movie. Bhakti is like watching a movie. Gana gao. Remember God. You know, <laughs> it's all good. But to become that moment, here and now, boom, immortal. That's beautiful. So in, uh, in your one of your works, um, uh, Shri M very beautifully quotes Upanishad. Yes. And, and uh, on consciousness, he particularly says that what is it that sees when I say I see? What is it that hears when I say I hear? What is it that speaks when I say I speak? Manasa na manyute, that even the mind cannot conceive, conceive of. of. Correct. So, so, I mean, you know, to sum it up, I mean, he very beautifully puts it. I think that's a beautiful way to end. And all I would say is that just sit up straight, everybody. Take a deep breath into your stomach. Empty your mind of all thought. Just watch your breath go into your stomach. You are everything. You are this universe. You are the beginning and the end. There is no space. There is no time. Just you. Just you. And if you wake yourself up and you lift your mind up your spine to your heart, and to your head and reach out to the whole world everything will become clear and the journey will be so beautiful let us chant Om together Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very kind. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you.